For the better part of 200 years, Jane Austen, one of Britain's most celebrated novelists, has continued to grow from strength to strength. The books were actually prescribed um, as a uh, medicine for shell shock during the First World War. What she wrote about isn't dated, because even though it was set in a different time period, human nature doesn't really change that much. Her works have been globally published building and sustaining a dedicated and ever-growing fan base spanning across a number of generations. With the aid of artifacts that have survived the ages, the relationships between Jane and her siblings have been well documented and thoroughly showcased. Yet the undeniably important links between her family and Alton, the neighbouring town to Chawton, a village of utmost importance to the Austen family, is yet to be revealed. Alton, being a small but bustling market town in which Jane frequented as a place for her personal and professional affairs, stood as a settlement for all of the Austen family's socialising, business and abode for many, many years. We want to explore these ties and to tell you the story surrounding Alton and Chawton's significance to not only Jane, but to the rest of the Austen family too. Jane, from about the age of um, just on 11, as I recently found out, she was allowed to read a lot of her father's books, which is quite unusual because some parents thought learning wasn't necessary for girls. But she was allowed to read a lot of her father's books and novels, which again, some people thought was quite shocking. You know, novel, novels were most unsuitable for girls. At any rate, she had, she had a great deal of reading and she obviously found she had a gift for writing. Upon his retirement from the church in 1801, Jane's father left the parish of Steventon and moved to Bath along with his wife and two daughters. The next five years of Jane's life is largely undocumented, as Cassandra destroyed the letters Jane sent during this period of her life. However, it is often observed that due to her father's struggling finances, she was unable to access the activities of high society that Bath had to offer. After Mr. Austin, their father, died, so they were living in Bath at the time, Mrs. Austin, uh, Cassandra and Jane were left in kind of financial dire straits. The three women led a fairly itinerant lifestyle, actually. They were down in Southampton for a while, and it was only when Edward offered them a home here in the village of Chawton that they had some kind of stability, and Jane Austen published all of her works from here. Chawton, a small but vibrant village based within East Hampshire, soon became an integral hub for the Austen family. But how and why did Chawton become a comfortable settlement for Jane and her family in the first place? The rich cousins, Mr and Mrs Thomas Knight, met Edward first when he was a little boy about 12. And he seems to have been a very nice little boy, good looking and engaging. I mean, all the Austin children were very nice, I'm happy to say, and didn't, didn't have any disagreeable young louts or loutesses. And for some reason, the Knights found they couldn't have children and they had large estates. So for somebody with large estates who realises they're going to be childless, they must find an heir. Fortunately, the heir to the Knight family's estates was Edward. And as a result of this, Edward was able to house his widowed mother and two sisters, Cassandra and Jane. Um, but there was this um, sort of low point in her life between leaving Stevenson and coming back to Chawton. And then when she came back to Chawton, um, oddly enough, she came back on a somewhat higher social level because Chawton was owned by her brother who from time to time came to live in the great house, or, if, or he lent it to his brothers and, if, if need be. And so she was no longer the poor daughter of the rector, she was the squire's sister. And that, I realised, did make quite a difference to her. And again, I think almost perhaps subconsciously, the three books she wrote while she was living in Chawton, uh, Mansfield Park, Emma and Persuasion, 
are all much more from the point of view of the squire's family, not from the rector's family looking up to the squire. Jane Austen always referred to the larger house as the great house in her letters, and it was as familiar to her as her own home. One letter talks about going to the great house, where she dawdled away an hour very comfortably. Other letters describe her dining at the great house with her brothers and sisters. The house is now a visitor attraction with the Austen family heirlooms, as well as a collection of early women's writing. First editions of Jane's work and many other women's writers are kept in the library's collection. The house also features the Knight family dining table, at which Jane herself would have dined, alongside a portrait of her brother Edward, his handwritten travel journal, and a suit he owned as a young man. In the grounds is an Elizabeth Blackwell-inspired herb garden, commissioned by Edward and frequently mentioned by Jane in her letters. We had a Charlotte Bronte letter here when she talks about reading Jane Austen's Emma. Um, this year we have um, the, the Jane Austen letter from 1798. We couldn't have exhibited this a few years ago because we need the proper, um, the proper museum cabinets for them. So this letter we have here has never been exhibited before. It's written on Christmas Eve, 1798. She, uh, Jane writing to her sister, Cassandra. She talks about a ball she went to in Many Down near, near Steventon. Um, and talks about dancing 20 dances and not being fatigued. She talks about her brother's illness, just all the thing, day to day things. So you get a more, more of an idea of her life at, at that particular point in time and, and, and what she was doing. This, this, the, this is um, uh, the reading room that did belong to the Knight family um, and, and would have housed their books or part of their collection here, here in this collection. And people can come here and view, the, view this room and have a, have a look around and see, see what sort of books that we have here in the collection. And then we've got exhibition cabinets all around the building so we, um, we can exhibit a lot of rare books for people to have a look at when they arrive. What, what I found when I, when I came here is that um, you, you do get people who are, I wouldn't say are fanatical but they are you know, sometimes they come in Regency dress they're sometimes they're very they're very immersed in Austin they, they do they do love her they, they get quite emotional when they come here to Jane Austen's house because there's something in her novels in her, in her works that um, resonate with them and um, if they've um, spent a whole life reading her novels about her and uh, reading her, reading her fiction, to then to actually come here to the place that she would have written it, you know, next door, and to come to the place she visited, they do, they do feel like they're coming to a, to a shrine, I would, I would think, or somewhere that they, they can really feel that they're actually, you know, connecting with Jane in, in some respects. So, which I don't know if you get, you do get with other authors, but I don't think many of them to the extent that you would with Jane Austen. I can't think of many examples of this happening with other writers. Jane Austen's House Museum in Chawton is the house where Jane Austen lived for the last eight years of her life and is the most treasured Austen site in the world. The museum receives between 40 to 50,000 visitors a year and houses an unrivaled collection of objects owned by Jane Austen and her family. It's a turquoise and gold ring um, and it was owned by Jane Austen. We don't know when she got it, uh, how she got it. She could have bought it for herself or it could have been a gift or something handed down from an older family member. Um, but what we do know is that it did belong to her and we can trace um, the story of the ring throughout her family. So we have the topaz crosses mm -hmm. uh, which are on display next to the ring um, and these were owned by Jane and Cassandra and I think they're one of my favourite objects, a pair of objects, because they were bought by uh, their brother Charles, their younger brother Charles, who is in the Royal Navy, and uh, got some prize money when, when naval ships caught a pirate ship. Um, all the, the money and uh, bounty was on the ship was divided up um, between all the crew, and it was, like, obviously the captain got the most, but you got, even as a midshipman, you got a small portion of of that money, the prize money, and with it, instead of buying something for himself, he bought necklaces for his two sisters, which is very sweet. And there's a, we have a letter as well, uh, which Cass uh, Jane wrote to Cassandra in 1801, saying that um, Charles should be thoroughly scolded for uh, spending all his hard-earned money on them. 
um, and they came to the museum in, uh, 19, in the 1970s and they were passed down with this letter. So again, we've got um, the provenance to know that these were the, the crosses. And what makes them particularly prevalent, I think, is that it's, I think, the, the closest connection we've got between Jane's real life and the novels. Because in Mansfield Park, uh, Fanny Price's brother William, who is also in the Navy, uh, buys her an amber cross with prize money he gets. So there's, there's lots of kind of references and inferences in the books to Jane Austen's life. Now settled in Chawton, it was during this period of Jane's life that she began to publish her books with the aid of her brother Henry. When she was in Chawton, she published Sense and Sensibility, she published Pride and Prejudice, she wrote Mansfield Park and Emma, and they came out straight away. She wrote Persuasion, which didn't come out till posthumous, and Northanger Abbey didn't come out till posthumous, but the, those four, S and S, P and P, M P, Emma. Those, those are the four that all came out while she was living in Chawton. She tried to get a novel called Susan published, um, and she sold the copyright for it to a publisher called Crosby for ten pounds. And then, a decade later, it still hadn't been published, so she bought it back. And it's that novel that came North, became Northanger Abbey. But she had dealings with different publishers within her lifetime. She sold the copyright for Pride and Prejudice outright. She got £110 for it. Um, she wanted 150 And then all her other novels she published at her own cost. And then the profits would be her t hers too. Henry was her agent, basically. I mean, they didn't call it that, but when you come to look at it, yes, he, he was her agent. He negotiated with publishers. He saw to it that the books were published, um, and she stayed with him so that she could visit publishers and so on. With the literary career now flourishing and surrounded by her family, we get a real sense that Jane was thriving in her time in Chawton. So 1809 to 17, she, she's very, very local. She knows the people in Chawton. She goes to Alton very frequently. She knows the Chawton Great House because that's her brother's house. And she was constantly trotting to and fro Alton. Basically, you can say that she knew all Alton High Street. Um, and her brother Henry had his banking business for a time in Alton High Street. Only a mile from Jane's home in Chawton, Alton, a bustling market town steeped in history, was the social and commercial hub for Jane and her family. Today, the town is an excellent centre for exploring the literary and cultural heritage of this part of Hampshire. The main focus of the town centre is the High Street, a section of Alton which has played a significant role in the lives of the Austen family. It was very convenient having Henry in the High Street and Steventon, um, James at Steventon, and although it's a bit further away, he used to ride over. Um, and Frank and Charles could come and stay at the great house, room enough for them to stay there if they needed to. So Chawton became um, another very good family centre, um, Chawton and Alton. And her doctor, Mr Curtis, the Quaker, Quaker Mr Curtis, lived in the high street. Um, and Colby, the draper that she bought things from, is also in the high street. Uh, and the Swan, she, um, the Swan, uh, the, the library group used to meet in the Swan. And we, we know she joined the uh, local library, so she'd have been in the Swan. Uh, so there's a great deal of, uh, of Austin connection still visible in Alton, which is, you know, which is jolly nice because all too many places, like Steventon, which has practically disappeared. Um, and the house she lived in in Bath was bombed in the war, that's gone. So I said to, um, to have the, uh, the, the surviving high street of Alton um, is, is very, um, you know, very uh, pleasant. Alton had everything they needed, you know, nice high street full of shops and doctor. Um, and Jane's apothecary, Mr Curtis, was in fact a Quaker, so they, they didn't meet socially in that sense, because he was treating her in 1817, and it was probably Addison's disease, 
which wasn't curable, I mean, wasn't recognised then. But it would have been interesting to know how he saw it and what medication he advised. And he presently said he couldn't help any further. And that was when she moved to Winchester, because there was a, a good hospital in Winchester. Um, and it was hoped that the surgeons, doctors there could do better. But of course, by that time, it was too late. and Nobody could have saved her. One hundred and eighty-nine years after her untimely death, an annual Regency supper and dance in Alton was established to commemorate Jane and her works. Since its birth, this yearly event has grown from strength to strength, increasing in popularity and notoriety within the Austin community. Now, Regency Week is a nine-day festival that gathers international attention and features regular events such as Regency Day, the Regency Ball, the Regency Choral Evensong, a concert, talks, guided walks, a Regency supper, and tours of the houses that Jane would have visited. Today I'm coordinating the Regency Day, which is the first event of the 2017 Jane Austen Regency Week in Alton. I always feel that uh, Alton is Jane Austen's best kept secret. She lived only a mile outside Alton. She used Alton in the way that most of us do now. She came in to do her shopping. She came in to visit friends. She came in to go to her brother's bank. She came in to get the coach from the Swan, which was a coaching inn, to London, much as we would go into Alton to get the train. I mean, it was Jane Austen's town. It is Jane Austen's town. You know, she's known all over the world. There are Jane Austen societies all over the world. There's a Jane Austen Society of Pakistan that's very active. Um, they're in all over Europe, obviously. We've just set up the Jane Austen Society of Switzerland because there wasn't one, a uh, friend and I, because, you know, because why not? And we've had our first meeting and everyone there was from Canada, Australia, America, Eastern Europe, Western Europe. It pulls people together, yeah. which is fabulous. And then they come to events like this. But that's, that's your people coming in. And what I would really love to see is the people who are here embracing it because she is, like I said, she's a Hampshire lass. At the moment, I think Jane Austen is so popular that all sorts of places want, want, want a little bit of her for themselves. And some places are more active than others in that respect. And I mean, Bath Festival is huge and very popular and attended by hundreds of people. But actually, Jane Austen didn't like Bath. She was by all means a country girl and she loved being in the country. She loved her country walks. She was probably most happiest in Chawton. While Jane never got to witness the full extent of her fame and literary success, her legacy as one of Britain's most celebrated authors is undeniable. Her work has been translated into 35 languages and produced into TV shows and feature films. There are Jane Austen societies in countries from the USA to Singapore, and as of 2017, she is the face of the £10 note. I gave um, the talk at Winchester Cathedral um, on the launch of the banknote and in the audience were people from all over the world who wanted to be in Winchester on the bicentenary of Jane Austen's death. So I think, and you know, it was the same here in the village of Chawton, people come on pilgrimage and they come on pilgrimage because they love her. Through the tireless work of local organisations, councils and fans, the story of Jane Austen's true home in Chawton and Alton is kept alive for future generations.